It's that time of year again, the Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, where all three major video game companies, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft- Wait, what? You're telling me that Sony is not attending at all this year? This is worse than Nintendo back in 2016. At least they had some form of appearance, even if they didn't have a conference or a digital direct or something like that. Here, Sony has nothing to show at E3. <sighs> I guess it's true what they say, E3 is dying, but it's an important event. It's an important event where the biggest, most important gaming announcements are made. Most of them anyway, but still, I, I don't get that. I mean, with the PlayStation 5 coming out, what, what the fuck is Sony doing? I mean, after three, two, three mediocre E3 conferences, they said fuck it and like, we're not gonna do shit at all? And then they had this whole state of play thing, which is a, a fucking ripoff of the Nintendo Direct and shit. Oh my god. Sony, what are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? You know what? I think we should try something different. Remember how I did E3 differently back in 2017? I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna do the annual E3 video that way. Anyway, let's take it from the top. It is the time of year where gamers get hyped. It is the time of year where we get huge announcements. And it is the time of year where questions are finally answered. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Electronic Entertainment Expo 2019. Well folks, this year's E3 is rather strange because this will be the first E3 ever without one of the big three console makers, Sony. Sony has attended E3 since 1995 when they made their legendary 299 announcement for the original PlayStation. And now, 24 years later, they're not attending at all. And with the PS5 coming out sometime next year, who knows when Sony will make their official PS5 announcement. Anyway, with that said, let's talk about the conferences. First up is Nintendo and the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo is now known for having the greatest turnaround in video game history. Their last console, the Wii U, was a miserable failure. As a result, Nintendo went back to the drawing board and created something innovative and truly spectacular, a hybrid console where you can play the full versions of the console games either at home or on the go. This wasn't like the PSP or PlayStation Vita where you were getting watered down versions of games. These were the full versions of the games. Sure some games will run at half the frame rate, lower resolutions, or have lower quality textures, but other than those things, you're getting the same experience as you get on PS4, Xbox One, and even PC to some extent. The Switch is an even better platform for indie games. Because they're not that demanding, the graphics, resolution, and frame rate are identical on all the platforms, including the Switch. But what makes the Switch the advantage over the other platforms is the portability aspect. Indie games are perfect for portable gaming. And of course, who could forget the first party exclusives? 2017, the year the Nintendo Switch launch, was Nintendo's comeback year. And comeback they did. The Switch had some great first party titles that year, such as ARMS, Splatoon 2, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, and the enhanced Wii U port of Mario Kart 8 titled Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which is actually the best-selling game on the Nintendo Switch. But the biggest games that year were the two Game of the Year winners, Super Mario Odyssey and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. 2018 was a good year for Nintendo as well, but not as good as their first year. 
There were great exclusives such as Kirby Star Allies, Square Enix's Octopath Traveler, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, and the granddaddy of them all, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. There was even another Wii U port, Bayonetta 2, but other than that and a few third party titles, not as good as 2017. But 2019 is looking bright for the Nintendo Switch. Travis Strikes Again, Yoshi's Crafted World, and the Wii U port Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze were released earlier this year. In February, many great games were announced for later this year. Damon X Machina, Platinum Games' Astral Chain, Luigi's Mansion 3, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening Remake, and of course Super Mario Maker 2. But the biggest announcement for later this year was the reveal of Pokemon Sword and Shield, the 8th generation mainline Pokemon title. This will be a milestone not only for the Pokemon series, but Nintendo platforms as well. Since 1998, Pokemon has been the main seller for Nintendo handhelds, and with the Switch being a hybrid that you can play at home and on the go, Pokemon Sword and Shield will take the series to a whole new level. We got a taste of that in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. This time, however, it's the main course. Sure, you can play the previous Pokemon titles on the Super Game Boy, Game Boy Player, and of course emulation, but those games were designed specifically for handheld gaming. Pokemon Sword and Shield will be the first in the series developed for both handheld and console gaming together and it's guaranteed to sell millions of Switch units this holiday season. And finally, third-party support. While it could be much better than it is right now, there has been plenty of third-party support, and it's a big improvement over the Wii U. Games like Doom, Wolfenstein 2, Skyrim, Dark Souls, Rocket League, Sonic Mania, Mega Man 11, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, Crash Team Racing Nitro Fuel, Wolfenstein Youngblood, and Mortal Kombat 11, and that's only scratching the surface. I didn't even mention the amount of Japanese third party support it has. Plus, Doom Eternal is planned for a Nintendo Switch release alongside the PS4, Xbox One, and PC versions. And like I mentioned earlier, the large amount of indie titles. Not only that, but Cuphead! Cuphead was released for the Switch this year. Yup, that's right, a Microsoft console exclusive indie title got ported over to the Switch, and nobody expected that. Thanks to its innovation and large quantity of quality titles, the Nintendo Switch has sold over 34 million units, not only greatly surpassing the Wii U and PS Vita, but also surpassing the likes of the Sega Dreamcast, Sega Saturn, GameCube, original Xbox, Sega Genesis, Atari 2600, and the Nintendo 64. And it is quickly closing in on the lifetime sales of the Xbox One. In terms of region-specific lifetime sales, the Nintendo Switch has already surpassed the PlayStation 4 in Japan, and that is incredible. Nintendo was able to make one hell of a dent on Sony's dominance in just two years. But as great as the Switch is, it has problems that need to be addressed, mainly with the online. In 2018, Nintendo launched the Nintendo Switch Online subscription service. It put online multiplayer and voice chat behind the paywall, save for a few games like Fortnite, Warframe, and Paladins. It also included some free to download NES titles, all for a yearly fee of $20. However, despite the low price, Many fans weren't happy with how Nintendo handled their online. You still need to use friend codes to add friends, you need a smartphone for voice chat, and some games like Super Mario Maker 2 won't even let you play with your online friends. To make matters worse, they're very slow when it comes to adding new retro titles, and there are still only NES titles. This is a downgrade from the virtual console. Like, where are the Super Nintendo titles? Where are the N64 titles? Game Boy Advance? GameCube? Wii? I mean, it's understandable that they didn't want to include a virtual console this time on the eShop, since they want indie developers to have their time to shine, 
But if you're gonna move retro games to a subscription-based service, you gotta have more to offer, come on. Fortunately though, things aren't all too bad. In February this year, Nintendo released the online exclusive Tetris 99, and it's been very popular on the Switch. And if you don't want to pay for the subscription service, you can pre-order a limited edition of Super Mario Maker 2 that comes with a year of Nintendo Switch Online for only $10 more. Nevertheless, there's definitely room for improvement. A lot of room for improvement. Now that brings us to E3. Since Nintendo got their Super Mario Maker 2 and Pokemon Directs out of the way, what exactly will they announce at their 45 minute presentation? Rumor has it that a smaller, handheld only Switch is coming, as well as a more powerful Switch Pro. A Microsoft slash Nintendo collaboration is also rumored. A Switch port of The Witcher 3 is rumored as well. Will all those be revealed? And what about other titles? Will Metroid Prime 4 and Bayonetta 3 get release dates? Will we get a new F-Zero title? A new Star Fox or a new Punch-Out? Will more third-party titles like Call of Duty Modern Warfare be announced? Will Nintendo finally make big improvements to the Switch Online service? Only way to find out is at E3 this year. Next up is Microsoft and the Xbox One. Throughout this entire generation, Microsoft has struggled to gain a foothold on the console market. Though sales have improved, selling at over 40 million units in total, the Xbox One was hurt by the initial pre-launch disaster back in 2013, which was infamous for the Always Online and Kinect Spy Cam. However, Microsoft has made valiant efforts and have greatly turned around their system. Kinect is long dead and buried, Xbox One is now backwards compatible with select Xbox 360 titles as well as original Xbox titles, they have strong support for cross-platform play, and unlike last gen, they haven't locked too many features behind the Xbox Live Gold paywall. In 2016, Microsoft released a slimmer version of the Xbox One called the Xbox One S. And in 2017, in response to the PlayStation 4 Pro, they released the Xbox One X. A system that is more powerful than the PS4 Pro, but is essentially an expensive watered-down gaming PC. But even though they've turned things around, the Xbox One does not have much to offer in terms of exclusives. Not quote-unquote Microsoft exclusives, actual console exclusives. Sure, most people enjoy playing Halo 5, Halo the Master Chief Collection, and Gears of War more on the Xbox, but the vast majority of Xbox One exclusives are on both Xbox One and PC, and they play better on PC. And it's easy to get into PC gaming nowadays. You don't really need to be a genius to build a gaming desktop, even kids could do that. Plus, services like Steam and GOG have been incredible and are way better than Xbox Live. And they are free on top of that. So one way or another, the PC versions of these quote-unquote Microsoft exclusives had the advantage. But it seems Microsoft is okay with that. In fact, since early this gen, Microsoft has taken a more relaxed and humble approach as opposed to their main competitor Sony, who seems to have become more arrogant and anti-consumer as of late, and Microsoft seems to be focusing more on helping out other platforms. As far as their E3 conferences go, they've been okay, but nothing really spectacular. That brings us to their E3 conference for this year. What will they announce there? Remember, Sony aren't the only ones coming out with a 9th generation console. The next Xbox is also in the works as well. Will they reveal the next Xbox? Will they at least show a teaser? Or will they wait until early next year? And what about the Project X Cloud streaming service that was announced last year? What promises does it have? Will their rumored partnership with Nintendo be announced before Nintendo's Direct? And what games will be announced there? Will Battletoads finally get a gameplay trailer and release date? Will the rumored Banjo-Kazooie title be announced? Will Halo Infinite finally get a release date? Only way to find out is at E3 this year. PC Gamer Magazine returns once again for the PC Gaming Show. This time, it's powered by the infamous Epic Game Store. What PC games, exclusive and multi-platform, will be announced this year? And with Epic Games there, 
Will games for Steam and GOG be announced as well? Only way to find out is at E3 this year. Many third party developers will be at E3 as well, some of which will have their own conferences again, including Bethesda, Ubisoft, Square Enix, and Devolver Digital. Keep an eye out for major announcements from those guys. Who will come out on top? Who will deliver the best conference? And who will deliver the best games? All of our questions will finally be answered at E3 this year. Like the previous years, all the big E3 conferences will be streamed on Twitch. You can find most of them on twitch.tv forward slash twitch, but there are other ways to watch the conferences. You can also watch live streams of E3 conferences on E3's official Facebook and Twitter accounts. Here are the dates and times for the conferences. Microsoft's conference will air tomorrow, June 9th at 4pm Eastern, 1pm Pacific. The PC Gaming Show will air on Monday, June 10th at 1pm Eastern, 10am Pacific. And you can catch that on twitch.tv forward slash PC Gamer, youtube.com forward slash PC Gamer, facebook.com forward slash PC Gamer Magazine, or twitter.com forward slash PC Gamer. And finally, Nintendo's E3 Digital Event. It will air on Tuesday, June 11th at 12pm Eastern, 9am Pacific. And you can catch that on twitch.tv forward slash Nintendo, youtube.com forward slash Nintendo, facebook.com forward slash Nintendo, or twitter.com forward slash Nintendo. And to spice things up, I'll be posting my live reactions. How will you find them? All you gotta do is either follow my Twitter page or like my Facebook page. The links are in the description. There, you will see all of my reactions to all of the conferences, and I will use the hashtags E3 and E3 2019. And after all the conferences are done, be sure to subscribe to my spin-off channel, A Square, for my quick thoughts on the E3 announcements. So until then, I'm AliRx, and I'll see you on the other side.